The scripture reading from Romans is dear to me. It spoke hope into my life when life was feeling precarious. It came to me as the result of my one great teen, act of teenage rebellion, which was to go through confirmation a second time. And abandoning St. Luke's, the small Presbyterian church I grew up in, to join First Presbyterian Church of San Rafael, a church about three and a half miles down the road. It began with attending youth group there where more of my friends were. Then I started going to the early service there, then back to attend the service at St. Luke's. First Pres was one of the first places it felt safe to name the crazy in my house that my mother was an alcoholic. At our confirmation retreat, we were each gifted with a scripture passage. Mine was this passage from Romans. It was indeed a gift, one of promise and hope. I desperately was in need of hope as my mother's disease had progressed to the point where her drinking would end because she quit or because she died. She quit, which was good. In hindsight, I wonder how her life might have been different if she had been gifted with scripture that brought her hope. She was also the product of an alcoholic home. Having spent the past four weeks focusing on and responding to gratitude, it seems to me that one of the blessings of steeping ourselves in what we are grateful for is hope. I've been reading The Witness of Religion in an Age of Fear by Michael Kinnaman. It is his supposition that contemporary American society is saturated with fear, fear that is often out of proportion to the threats that we face. This happens in part, he says, because fear sells. His intent is to argue that the major world religions all warn about the dangers of excessive fear. But the reality is, we all have some powerful and important things to say and to witness to a fearful culture. A truth that is bigger than the sometimes exaggerated media or special interest group reports of crime, violence, fear of the other, meant to sow seeds of fear. There are times when fear is the correct response, but regularly succumbing to fear is antithetical to what it is we say we believe, how it is that we understand God Scripture is filled with verses to remind us that God is always present. For example, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And of course, then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. Certainly, there are times when fear is useful. It can keep us from doing something stupid or alert us to a real danger. But living in fear or a constant state of anxiety takes a toll on our mental, physical, and spiritual health. But 
If we are the body of Christ, if we believe what we profess, what do we really have to fear? If we are the body of Christ and we believe what we profess, we have a powerful message of hope to share. I think there are probably a lot of people in here and out there who are in need of hope. I know there are days when I'm one of them. If we are the body of Christ, we have a mission to love the Lord our God and our neighbors as ourselves. We have a radical message of hope and love to share. We are people created to be in community and not isolation. Jesus' ministry and teaching were about inclusion, not exclusion. To be sure, as Grace, we have and continue to offer hope in tangible ways through the Help the Homeless Backpack Ministry, the Bucket Builds, Hygiene Kits, Tutoring, the Tri-Cities Work Camp and Honduras Trips. Hope flows through our prayer, care, floral, and hospitality ministries. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. In general, hope in scripture has to do with the expectation of a favorable future under God's direction. Hope has different meaning in, meanings in the Old and New Testaments. The focus in the Old Testament has more to do with waiting, expecting, confidence, and trust. It's Paul who develops a deeper understanding of hope in his letters. His starting point is justification by faith. And what that ultimately means for Paul is that we can be in relationship with God, which opens the way to salvation to those who believe and are in unity with God. Later in chapter 15 of Romans, Paul writes, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Our hope stems from our individual and collective experiences with God. Where others might see coincidence, we see the hand of God at work. Living with hope is seeing the glass half full, not half empty. In some ways, popular culture is leading the way. I don't watch much TV, but my daughter Amy introduced me to the rebooted Queer Eye. If you are not familiar with the show, friends or family members generally nominate a man, generally a man in their life for a life makeover. And in come the Fab Five. Antony, whose specialty is food and wine, Tan, the fashion expert, Karamo, who focuses on culture, Bobby, who takes care of design, and Jonathan, whose area is fashion. As we watched a recent episode, I realized that this is actually a ministry of caring and hope. Yes, they help with organization, cooking, fashion, hairstyles. But mostly they observe. They ask questions. And they listen. Really listen. So yes, they build confidence in the men, an occasional woman. They work with fashion and personal care, living arrangements, culinary arts. But what they really do what their ministry is, and yes, I believe it's a ministry and calling, is name out loud the fear or insecurity that they hear in the conversations they have with the people they work with. I'm not the only one who had that epiphany. On July 23rd, Joy and Natanya Thompson wrote a comment, commentary for Sojourners about Queer Eye, in which she noted, Whenever you find tears in your eyes, 
Especially unexpected tears, it is well to pay closest attention, wrote Frederick Buechner. They are not only telling you something about the secret of who you are, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them. Later in the commentary, she notes Queer Eye is more than an uplifting reality television show. At this moment in culture, the Fab Five's week-long makeovers have taught us what it means to minister to a hurting person, reveal their value, and help them open up to joy and love. It's a ministry of presence and hope. There is external transformation, but more important is the internal transformation that takes place. This summer, Amy and I have also been enjoying what we call Matinee Mondays. Two of the movies in particular that we've seen shared wonderful examples of hope. One, Won't You Be My Neighbor by Mr. about Mr. Rogers needs no explanation. But this past week, we saw eighth grade. The movie opens with the main character, Kayla, who has an online blog, video versus written blog, encouraging her minuscule audience to be themselves. While she's offering encouragement and hope to those who might be watching, I think she's also talking to herself. Writing about the film, Abby Olsies notes, most of us who managed to survive middle school regard it as the most awkward time in our lives when we care deeply about how others, see, how others see us, but we're just as deeply unsure of how we saw ourselves. Eighth grade uses that to tell a story about perception, one which applies to adults as much as it does to 13 and 14 year olds. Burnham's film explores how we want to be perceived by others, the harsh way we perceive ourselves, and the way that we are perceived by those who see us fully and love us unconditionally. In the midst of all that middle school angst and awkwardness, Kayla's dad continues to affirm her and love her unconditionally. He sees her for who she really is. Not the awkward eighth grader, but her beautiful, creative, genuine self. Perhaps that's why she's able to affirm and offer hope to others through her videos. Friends, each of us is created by and endowed with gifts from God. Each of us has a choice to be mired in fear and anxiousness or to use our gifts to move forward in hope. There are a myriad of ways we can offer hope and help change the world. In his book, World Changing 101, Changing the Myth of Powerlessness, David Lamott, author, writer, songwriter, and musician, he's also part of a group called Abraham Jam, an interfaith band made up of a Christian, David, a Muslim, Dawood Warnsby, and a Jew, Billy Jonas. He's a speaker and an all-around nice guy, writing about, and writing about hope, he quotes Vaclav Havel, hope is not a prognostication, is in an orientation of the spirit. Lamont continues, hope is the conscious decision to live toward the world you would like to see to take action to move closer to a better way, regardless of your chances of achieving your goal. The historian Howard Zinn writes, to be hopeful in bad times is not to be foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of competition and cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. The future is an infinite succession of presence and to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, 
it is itself a marvelous victory. Ultimately for Lamott, hope is an active choice and a choice to be active. Since I can't think of a single reason why you wouldn't actively choose hope, let's look at some ways we all might live in and share hope with others. A few of Kinnaman's suggestions include becoming more intentional about seeing church as a place where fears can be shared and discussed. He notes that death, usually the big fear, has already been conquered by Christ. Voicing our fears in a safe place removes their power. Practicing conversations with those whom we genuinely disagree and really listening. As people of religious faith, to speak out together against fear-mongering in public life. To join in prayer with our brothers and sisters of other religious faiths. We agree on so much more than those things where there's disagreement. I would also suggest being present. At work camp, I was once again reminded that while the work we were doing it was important, it was just as, if not more important, to be engaged with the people in whose homes we, where the work was being done. The work was necessary, to be sure, but it's really a vehicle for the ministry of presence. And while the teens were there to do work, it was just as, if not more important, to be in a place where it was safe to be their own best personal selves. Being generous in spirit, acknowledge the people you pass by with a smile or a simple greeting. Hold the door. Let the parent with the cranky kid go ahead of you in the checkout line. Being generous with compliments. Being generous with yourself. Choose to see that glass half full, not half empty. Intentionally looking for things and to notice things that fill you with joy and hope. Hang out with a preschooler. They see wonder everywhere, and they are great theologians. They will fill you with much hope. Read scripture and remember God's promises and the promises that have already been fulfilled. Save for one, even the Psalms of Lament have words of hope. Share where you see hope. There's one last board in the narthex where you can share what brings you hope or where you find hope. And finally, Hold on to these words from Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to the grace in which we stand. And we boast of our hope, sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endures produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Thanks be to God. Amen.